the San Diego Comic Convention, uh, to the Storyboards panel. We are very excited. I know this is a weird year. It's a crazy year. Um, but uh, these panels are such an important part of what we do at Marvel. We love coming to San Diego every year. We love talking to the fans. We love uh, seeing you. We miss seeing you. Uh, but uh, hopefully this is a uh, uh, something that at least uh, hopefully this is something that, that we can still have fun with and uh, bring you some of the cool new stuff happening uh, at Marvel, uh, including the topic of this very panel, which is a new show that uh, Marvel New Media has produced called Storyboards, um, starring someone very important uh, to the history of Marvel. Uh I have been told he was a former editor-in-chief. Uh, I have told he is uh, very important creatively uh, to Marvel. I've never met him, um, but uh, we're excited to have him with us today. His name is, uh, I believe it's Joe Quesada. Am I getting that correct? I'm sorry, and you are. <laughs> uh, my name By the way, is... By the way, whoever you are, Whoever you are, that was such a heartfelt welcoming welcome to the fans. I, I got a little verklempt there, a little choked up. You know, we do miss the fans. We we actually we all miss each other in so many ways. Uh, hi, Steve. How are you? I'm doing great, Joe. Thanks for remembering my name. I see you got the email. It's I I, I got it. It's written here. It's written here. It's a. <laughs> It's Steve W. They didn't put your last name in there for whatever reason. Uh, but yeah, I got some cue cards that'll help me. I also have like a little card here that says, if the host gets annoying, just disconnect and continue with Adam. So. Yeah, I think everybody's got that button with me on their yeah. Uh, computers. Yeah, uh, it's like an ejector seat, except it's digital. So we're, <laughs> we're talking uh, storyboards today. And I know yeah. that this was super important for you to be a part of this online San Diego experience because you have such, uh, shall we say, rich history uh, with Comic-Con. You've done this Cup of Joe panel for, I don't know, since the 60s? How long has this been going, going on? I don't know, man. Uh, it's, it's been a long time. Actually, my, my history with San Diego Comic-Con uh, starts like before before I even started my career, professional career in comics. I, I, I went to the con a year before I actually broke in uh, with a buddy of mine just to sort of get a sense of what it was like. I mean, I, I guess I was a working professional because I was a colorist at Valiant, but I wasn't working as an artist where people would kind of see my name on a product. Um, and I, I think man, it, it's that that was 89, no, maybe 90. So I had a continuous streak of going to San Diego since then and actually last San Diego was the first time I hadn't gone since I, I started going. So you've seen a lot of growth growth in that show then. Over oh my the years. god! Oh my god! Yeah, I, I saw it go from you know from uh, uh, you know a, a conference hall, and then move up from there. The building of the convention center, the, the, the you know when it was still smaller, and then and when it expanded, and you know I remember, remember when they opened up the expansion of the convention center, and you couldn't see from one end to the other because of atmosphere. <laughs> Just strictly like like the atmosphere of the earth would not let you see the other side of the convention. I remember uh, we used to comment that it was kind of like the end scene in Indiana Jones when they open the you know the doors and it just that that warehouse goes on forever. Uh, it was so massive. It was it was the biggest thing you know biggest sort of show of any kind I've ever seen. Uh, but you know it's it's the, the power of comics, the power of genre, and uh, it's it's uh, it's an incredible show to go to. And it's sad that it's not happening this year. Uh, kind of like baseball season. I don't think baseball season is going to happen this year. Um, so missing San Diego, everybody's missing San Diego this year. And, uh, you know, hopefully we come back bigger and stronger. But I guess one of the side effects now is because of uh, San Diego's ability to produce something like this, now we can bring San Diego to more people than ever, which is kind of cool. Um, yeah, yeah. On In your uh, experience there, Cup of Joe started when you were working at Marvel, correct? Once you took on EIC, there was no Cup of Joe before that. When I had my, my own company, Event Comics, uh, in the books I would have a column. Uh, and that was something that, you know, we then, we then, I'm trying to think if I started, if I started a weekly column when I was at Marvel Knights, I don't think Jimmy and I had anything weekly, but we were doing a lot of interviews. But when I became editor in chief, uh, started a column called Joe Fridays. Uh, and that and that oh, then right. eventually, yeah, Joe Fridays then eventually morphed into uh, Cup of Joe, which then became the name of 
the panels that I would do in San Diego. And for those who aren't aware, it's basically a catch-all for, for, for anything you want to ask, uh, whether you want to ask me stuff about Marvel, my career, my fashion choices, my choices in Friends, anything. Like that. So, so, so I would take on all comers and, and that panel started to grow and grow and grow. Uh, and then we started having guests in the panel. So it, it's, it's taken on many, many shapes. You know, one of the things that made those panels special, I remember, because I was working for another company at the time, was it did feel like for the first time you could go to someone at a very high level at one of these comic companies and ask anything. Like you said, you took all com comers and it was a panel that actually made news beyond just announcing new projects. It was either you taking people behind the scenes or you handling, uh, you handled a lot of criticism in those panels. Um, but, well, yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's, you know, it was the same thing with the, it was the same thing with the, the, the weekly column because the column wasn't on marvel.com. It was actually, I, I chose to do it in an outside news source. Uh, at one point it was on Userama, another point it was on at, at comic book resources. And the reason for that was because if we did it through Marvel, I think fans would get the sense that the questions were curated and I really wanted questions that were no filter, right? So, so it was the good and the bad, right? Right from you know the the the, the mind of our fans right to me. And because the, the other thing, I I'm going to go back a little bit to when when I was a kid, uh, reading Stan's soapbox. And what I loved about Stan's soapbox, obviously, was was how personal, how how you felt like he was talking directly to you. I don't have that power that Stan has. It's a real mutant power. But I had the internet. And I remember as a kid reading a soapbox, uh, and, it, and it was a soapbox telling all us Marvel fans that Jack Kirby had left to go to DC Comics. And I'm reading this, and Stan is like tackling it directly. Hey, this is what happened. Jack is moving on. We wish him luck, and 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 you know we're but we're okay because we have Steve Ditko. We got John Romita. And as a kid, I'm reading this, and I'm I'm like dying because I love Jack Kirby. I mean, it's it's Stan and Jack was every it was everything to me in, in terms of like defining Marvel. And reading this, and then Stan going, it's okay. Look at who we have. Look at look at our entire bullpen. And I'm like, okay, that's cool. We're good. But at the same time, even as a kid, I knew. Man, he's really letting you in behind the scenes. He's really letting you see how the sausage is made and sometimes when the gears stop, but he explains to you why they do. And I always carried that with me because, again, Stan was creating a, a, a Marvel lifestyle. You know, companies later discovered that this is a good way to treat your customers. So, so when I became editor-in-chief, I'm like, you know what? I always made it a point. When we were doing event comics, I would tell fans, "Hey, listen, this is the stuff that breaks down. Yeah, it broke down. Here's why, right?" And 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 sometimes people walk away angry, but a lot of times people walk away going, "Oh yeah." So so it's kind of like a regular job. Things get messed up. Yeah. So so the cup of Joe or the Joe Friday to cup of Joe columns were very much that. And then when we did the panels, it was crazy awesome because sometimes when you give people bad news or you're very really frank with them over the internet. It's very easy to misinterpret the intent. But when you hear someone say this directly to you, it really, you know, fans walked away going, oh, okay, I, I get it. I I'm not happy with it, but but they understand the sincerity in your, in your voice. They can yeah. hear just in the inflections that what's really going on. It grew from beyond um, just being something for the fans. You started having, um, obviously, the people on the on the stage group you had a lot of our comics talent uh and then people beyond and getting to the topic of of the panel storyboards i know the idea behind storyboards came out of these cup of joe panels that we're talk talking about and the way those panels evolved so talk a little bit about that sort of progression from cup of joe to what uh storyboards is well the the what we're really we're really uh, sparked an idea in me was was during a New York comic convention where I just wanted to shake up the you know I mean it become a Joe became you know it, it became what it became and then it morphed through time and then it sort of solidified and I wanted to just shake things up a little bit so I I, I just put it out on social media Marvel put it on social media that I was going to do this this interview with a very special guest you do not want to miss it now my heart's pounding because I'm thinking well without really saying who it is. I wonder if there's going to be anybody at the panel. Well, it turns out when I come on stage, it's standing room only and there were still people outside. And news had not leaked of who the guest was. And then when the guest came out, it was Daredevil himself, Charlie Cox, uh, from our Daredevil Netflix show. 
Marvel's Daredevil. Episode. And the place went crazy. And Charlie was, you know, he was his typical charming self, uh, told great stories. Uh, we had his friend come up to tell a story. I mean, it was, it was, just, it was great. We just had a great time. And then, and then I was struck with the idea of, wow, you know, maybe, maybe, you know, since at that point, new media was sort of starting to come into its own and building up content and things like that. And I thought, wow, maybe this is a show. So I presented to the folks in New Media, but with the with the, with the twist, uh, because again, talking to Charlie, I mean, Charlie's really athletic, and he does crazy things like going onto a frozen lake, opening a hole, and jumping in and jumping out, right? That kind of thing. And I thought, wow, you know, that might be a not a cool thing for me to do, but a, an interesting thing to see me do. Uh, if I interviewed a guest, and but part of part of the interview was to partake in different activities, things that they either love, that they're known for, or hobbies, or what it may be. Uh, and and you know, so in my mind, it's like, yeah, if I was interviewing Charlie for the show, okay, we'd either play soccer or football, sorry, or you know, I'd do this diving into the ice kind of thing. Um, uh, and that's where the idea came from, and uh, and away it you went. You do relate all this stuff because uh, I, I know I, I know you well enough to know this is sort of the prism of how you see things in general. But you do sort of relate all those events back to storytelling, and either the different stories people have to tell about their own life, or the way these can become tools uh, for people who want to tell stories. Um, yeah, and I'm just curious: is that what when you were making the the guest list for this? for this first season and the second season, I, I assume you were looking through everyone through how can I learn what, what bit of storytelling can I learn from them or can I share with, with them? Yeah. I mean, I mean, look, everybody's got a story, but the thing, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not sure if people realize that, that every single one of us is a storyteller. We do it all the time, right? Even if you don't do it for a living, right? Let, let's say you're, uh, you're, let's say you're a mid-level executive at Marvel. With. Yeah. Okay. Like, yeah. Let's say you're not a lot example. going on personality wise, not much of a future, right? You're kind of stuck where you are. Uh, yeah. so when you come home from work on the days that you used to come home from work, um, you know, you'll sit down and, and, and you'll tell your family, boy, this is what happened to me today. And, and you'll talk about that and they'll tell you what happened. And we're all telling stories all the time, all day long. Uh, that's what we do. And if we stop to think about it, the world is chaos. It's total chaos and anarchy. Stories are the 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 antidote to that, right? They add the order to our life. They they, they are the salve to sometimes all the craziness. Sometimes we need them more than more than others. Uh, like right now, right? And and then there's there's times where it's just you know they're just a, a, a humorous distraction, but we're always telling stories. So all the people that were chosen for this show. All the guests come from a wide variety uh, of, of different fields, uh, arts, whatever, wh whatever you can imagine. It was it was a, it was a it was a wide swath because I wanted to demonstrate that no matter what it is that you're doing, you're telling a story. Does it? You know, if you're if you're a figure skater, you know, you're telling a story on the ice with your body. If you're a comedian, you're, compl you're clearly telling stories about your life or about how you look at life. Um, if you're a mountain climber, you come back with the greatest stories ever. Uh, you know, and, 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 and the big twist for me was like, like what it was one of my, we'll talk about that episode later, but, but you know, the, 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 the wonderful lesson for me was, you know, I'm thinking, oh, I'm interviewing one of the world's, if not the world's greatest mountain climber. So this is going to be a story about reaching the pinnacle, right? Those, those metaphors for success, whatever success, how you define it. But that wasn't what I learned. What I learned is it's not getting to the top. It's being able to come down alive, <laughs> you know, and be able to tell that story, uh, which was, which was, you know, again, I, and even that, uh, I took that and added it to a story that I was, that I was doing at Marvel that is already printed, which was a, a single page, uh, the single page thing I did for Marvel 1000 of Daredevil, um, that was inspired directly by Ed Veaster, who was, who was that, my guest that day. Uh, I love watching you with, with Ed too, because it's got one of my favorite moments, uh, from the series. There's a yeah. moment where you're standing there in snowshoes, those like tennis rackety snowshoe things you see on cartoons. And then it's it's as if out of nowhere, gravity takes over and you just <laughs> plummet to the ground. 
what I, what I like s- a Keystone Cop. It slaps yeah. slapstick. Yeah, that that was that was. Not I, I must have watched would, that a hundred times. I had it on a loop. When 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 I saw that in in, in one of the, the the longer cuts, I'm like, first of all, we have to keep that. Second of all, can we amplify the sound when I smack against the snow because it's just it's it's too funny. It, it, it was it was just you know it's just one of those things that 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 ended up being very funny. The the cameras were in the right place and the sound was perfect. But uh, but yeah, that that episode was crazy. Uh, you know because you know I I am huffing and puffing. We're we're in altitude that's well above six thousand feet, and we're in perfect. St- it literally, like, like there, there was there was no snow in, in Sun Valley, Idaho, prior to this, and the night before we got eleven inches of beautiful fresh powder. So so Ed and I were out there breaking trail, which is you know thankfully he was ahead of me, but he's just like la da 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 da, and I'm literally behind him like like. Did you pack a sandwich? Because I'm dying. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and and the, and the other thing that made it even harder was that that uh, that I bought like Ed had suggested what snowshoes I should buy, and I ordered the size that was that, like like a like a much bigger size for much deeper snow. So Ed had like the cool like you know stealthy shoes, and I'm like I got these elephant feet that are just like dragging snow <laughs> behind me. I, I was dying. <laughs> Uh, but that was one of it was one of my favorite episodes because I, I you know again got to do something with someone uh, that I would you know never have thought I'd ever get an opportunity to do. And the show you start in New York, obviously, but the show takes you to different parts of the city, takes you to different parts of the country. Yep. Um, let's talk about some of the guests in uh, season one because it's a pretty wide array from yep. uh, from your your Rolodex, I imagine. We start close to home with. Uh, uh, you, you're talking to Margaret Stoll, who was yep. a writer on The Life of Captain Marvel. She's a YA novelist. Um, you talk to her about uh, a lot of different parts of her life, what, what led her as a yep. writer and some of her her passion for storytelling. And then you do something super cool with her in that uh, flight simulator. At the Intrepid. We went to the, we went to the Intrepid, Intrepid. In, in, yeah, over on the west side of, of New York in, in Manhattan. Uh, which, which, you know, since we we're talking about, about a lot about Captain Marvel, we felt like that was a great setting. But the the thing that I mean, you and I both know Margie. Uh, we've known her for a long time. We we, we love her dearly. She's just um, she's just an amazing person, an amazing talent. But probably more than any of the guests that I might, that I've interviewed for the series, so much of Margie's early years, her childhood, is fascinating and you could see how how she 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 took that upbringing those lessons and applied it to her work and to to her to her success uh it, it just it, it's it's an amazing story you know and especially when she talks about her mom which um you know we we we, we went deep man you know and, and and she just she just she took me there and 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 uh i learned so much about her and you know it just ended up loving her more I tend to cry like a baby. <laughs> oh, boy. oh my god! Oh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. Let me bring us back here. Maybe if I did a barrel roll. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> this is not what they show you in flight academy. Uh oh. Uh oh. I don't think this is how it works. <laughs> Oh my God, that was actually hilarious. Oh God, <laughs> nicely done. Talk a little bit about we work with uh, you work with uh, Kristen Borel, and that sort of yeah. relates back to comics. So he's big Broadway star currently in uh, Little Shop of well, no one's in anything currently, but uh, was last in uh, Little Shop of Horrors, which I saw him in on Broadway. He's ter- he's terrific, but he's got a love yep. of Marvel that goes back decades, and well. Uh, he- I know it was important. To, it was so cool for him to meet you as a, just he's just a big comic geek like all yeah. of us. You know, you, you you meet a lot of people in different industries. You know, in particular the film industry and stuff like that. Who say, "Oh yeah, I'm a comic fan," right? But you know, they're not quite really a com- like 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 a Wednesday Warrior. Christian is a Wednesday Warrior, right? I mean, I mean, you. I'm not, I don't know if I should say what his local shop is, but you go Wednesday. You know, on Wednesday, I look, there's Christian, right? He's a hardcore 
hard, hardcore comics fan long before he, he was introduced to anybody at Marvel. And he is an amazing actor and, 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 and you know, on, on Broadway, on TV and films. And he's, and he's done, what I love about Christian also is that, that he's done a wide variety of things, right? You know, you know this better than anybody, Steve. For those who don't know, Steve was trying to be an actor during his younger days. He even did some commercials. Uh, Are you asking me to do some scene work right now? I'd love to. Uh, if you choose to embarrass yourself, you're, you're more than welcome to. But <laughs> Christian, it's like he knew more about Marvel Comics than I did. And and yeah. also, he's part of a, of a really amazing program that we have at Marvel called Marvel Spotlight. He's one of the one of the, the playwrights for, for these these amazing plays that we did for uh, for schools. Uh, actually, you, you know about this, Steve. You, you you were in the middle of all this too. Yeah, he 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 wrote a play, a Thor and Loki play that's been uh, yeah. it's been produced all around the country at high schools. It's going on right now. There, there's a Ms. Marvel play. Yeah. Uh, there's also a uh, Squirrel Girl uh, play. Um, so yeah, he he was a part of that, and his love for the character certainly came through, and his yeah. knowledge. So so what I challenged him, I challenged him in my in, in my episode to a uh, acting off or a performance off to see, you know, to see if, uh, yeah, if my I, money's uh, on if, him. If, if, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. My acting chops, uh, they weren't too bad. I mean, I, you know, it, it was a cold read and, and I asked him to direct me because, you know, he, he's directed on the stage. So um, he was a very cruel director. <laughs> Staying on that sort of performing arts uh, topic, I love the one with um, Robert Lopez. Oh, yeah. Uh, and so, you guys actually write a song. We do. We do. What, the, the, first of all, okay, so, 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 so never in my life did I think I'd ever be hanging out with an EGOT winner, right? Um, so is that Emmy, Grammy, Oscar, and Tony. And he's done it twice. And and I think he's one award short of doing it three times. I mean, seriously, right? So, so and, and, and more than anything, he's the guy that wrote "Let It Go." He and his wife. Long before I was in comics, I was a musician and a songwriter. So, so it, you know, the perspective that I that I come to Robert with is one of like you know just understanding how difficult it is to to compose the way that he composes, right? I mean, he's he's done so many brilliant songs, and he, and first of all, I was struck with how humble and shy he was and how nervous he was about the, about the next project that he was working on. Right. It's just like, you would think that somebody that, that that's won that many awards would be like, yeah, I got this, but that's, that wasn't the case. It was very much like, Oh man, I hope people like this. And, and, and you gotta love that because, you know, I, I think a lot of creative people, myself included, you know, while the veneer outside, when we're putting out a new product, it's like, yeah, it's going to be cool. It's going to be great. Deep down inside, we're like, oh, man, I hope people like it. We just don't know, right? Because you're in the eye of the hurricane. Uh, so we talked a lot about that, about about his his growing up. And, and and you know, because he's, he's a New Yorker. So so we started in Times Square. And then we ended up in a piano bar where we he just started playing some songs. He, he played Let It Go. And, and then we decided that we were going to create a song there. I have a guitar there because I'm shameless. Uh, and, you know, I'm because that kind of Because you a always guitar. carry a guitar around. You're one of those people. I'm the guy. You're at a picnic, and suddenly, let me get my guitar. We're at a party. Let me get that. Let me get my guitar because everybody loves to hear me play. So, so I have my guitar there, and and we 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 talked about what do we want to write about, and then we were talking about the the people that were dressed as characters on the street, right? Because we met all of them. We met Spider Man. We met Elsa. We met all. Of them. So we started writing this song about you know about we called him Pudgy Spider Man because he was a he was he wasn't a svelte Spider Man, but the uh, the lyrics were about um, how Pudgy Spider Man was in, in love with the woman who dressed up as Elsa, you know, and he c- couldn't just <laughs> let, couldn't let it go. He couldn't let it go. So uh, so we had some fun with that. Uh, it was a good time. Um, another great one. Another great episode, a season one episode, is when you're with uh, um, Natalia Cordova Bucky. Oh. You're with Yo-Yo from from Agents yeah. of Shield, and uh, uh, I don't want to say you get your butt kicked, but you guys do some stunt work, no? 
we we do some well first of all um for those that don't know natalia uh is a prima ballerina you know she 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 traveled the world she's she's an amazing dancer join the club yeah i didn't know that about you steve i knew you were flexible but i didn't know that so i asked natalia and, and also, she she loves to do her own stunts. She loves to, to 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 get into the fight scenes, and 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 it's something that she didn't come to Agents of Shield uh, with that skill set, but she learned it, man. So as she was she was showing me some of her moves, I'm like, whoa! Uh, but I asked her to 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 you know run me through some ballet stretches. Um, I, I needed an ambulance to come pick me up afterwards, uh, because they had to untwist me out of the pretzel that I was tied into, but it was fun. And, and we talked about her upbringing in Mexico and what life was like. And, 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 you know, especially, you know, for her, her family, uh, and, 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 and the importance of her work today and, 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 and how she, you know, how she feels she's representing, you know, uh, you know, Latin women and, 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 and women in general. Uh, and I think that comes across in, in her, you know, in her work at shield for sure, you know, where she plays one of the, you know, strongest heroes we have. And, and, and she does it with such grace. Uh, and that's really what I loved about her was just like, like, like everything, uh, you know, it, it was like a ballet. She just, she just does things with, with great grace. And you got some martial arts training that has stuck with you. I don't, yeah. I don't know if I call it training. Uh, but <laughs> I certainly have <laughs> bruises I walked away with. And back. And see that really see that. So give oh. it. Hang on. <laughs> yeah. So if you're here, you can loosen that like, you know, just like, uh. <laughs> Close it up. If you watch no other episode, any chance to watch Joe getting his butt kicked, I highly recommend. Another great one, I mean, the first season is packed. You've got also Johnny Weir, who's oh, yeah. one of our most famous ice skaters. Uh, how did that happen? Um, Aside from your ice skating skills. Yeah, my ice skating skills. Uh, my daughter's a figure skater. So, uh, so she lives in that world. And through her and her coaches and, and, and just having it, having figure skating be a part of our family. Uh, I've met Johnny on, on a few occasions. And when, you know, when the show became a reality, I just thought, oh my God, it, it's, I'd love to get Johnny on, you know? And, and at one point schedules weren't lining up and I was like, ah, so disappointed. And eventually it did line up and he was just amazing because the, the thing for me, it, again, having a daughter who's in, in the, the, the skating world profession, you go to a lot of skate shows and you, know, you get you get to see a lot of incredible Olympians, incredible, you know, national champions. And but I will always I, I don't care what a, what, you know, championships or awards Johnny has won. I will always pay anything to see Johnny perform because he is an amazing, amazing performer. He does things on the ice that are just just stunning. You know, the, the, the way he expresses himself, the way the body movements, the showmanship, I mean, just crazy showmanship, yeah. choice of music, the whole thing, wardrobe, right? He's so meticulous about those things. And he's such a fascinating human being and such a forerunner in so many ways in the world of ice skating and a tremendous athlete. You know, the, that's the other thing. I, I've never been to a show where I've seen Johnny miss a jump. I just, I just, uh, you know, I've seen him perform like 10, 12 times, never missed a jump. I'm sure he does. I've just never seen it. So um, it, it was it was it, it was such a such a pleasure to sit down and really just dig into his life and talk about it. But then, Steve, you know what happens? I go on the ice with him. I don't skate. <laughs> I just never skated before, and you know, you and, and it's funny. You know, it's well. really, no, I can, I can barely <laughs> stand. You know. Uh, <laughs> But but you know what's funny, Steve? This is a this is a tribute to you. I'm gonna I'm gonna tip my I'm gonna tip my cap to you. Okay. When I got on the ice with Johnny, and then literally my legs are going like this, right? And the cameraman's <laughs> laughing, and the, everybody in the side is laughing, right? All I could think about was I, I just can imagine when Wacker sees this thing. That's all I could yeah. think about. It's like Steve's gonna see this thing, and he's just gonna be at me 
mercilessly. Merc- each, each episode has a Merc- moment like that, one of those moments where it's yeah, yeah. humiliating for you. And I think, oh, that's for me. That's a moment just for me. And really, but it's for know. everyone. It's for our fans yeah. who have waited yes. to watch this. Right. Steve, you, you know me better than anybody. I have no problem humiliating <laughs> myself. Sometimes I do it on purpose. Everything you just said about uh, his performance, what I love in the episode is how it all goes through the prism of storytelling again. And the fact that he looks at that talent and that job and what he does through the prism of storytelling was fascinating to me. And look, I mean, it's 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 even even doing that episode, right? He, you know, he he prepared for it like a performance, right? He, you know, there there, there, was, there was there was the outfit and there was the way that he was going to do his hair for the outfit, for the story he was going to tell, you know, for being on the ice, the whole thing. I mean, it's 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 total professional showmanship to 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 to, to just an incredible degree um, that you know he gets on the ice and he's going to be Johnny Weir, and and by the way, he we filmed it at Chelsea Piers. He walks through Chelsea Piers and just like everybody freezes. Just like, is that <laughs> is that is that yes it is awesome. yeah uh, yeah it's amazing. The first episode of the season, our premiere episode, is, of course, someone very important to Marvel f- fandom, uh, someone you know well. He's a, a little-known actor from Australia who mm. played Wolverine in some movies yes. over the past few, in some movies. few years. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So Hugh Jackman is the first guest on Storyboards. Yeah. You know, so I'll, I'll, t- I'll tell you a funny story. It's, it's like Hugh and I... Uh, had known each other for, for some time, but we had, you know, it was through phone calls, email, text. We had never physically been in the same room together until that moment, which, you know, had a lot of people thinking that you and I were sort of the same guy. I get it. We're not, right? So it was like meeting a friend I hadn't seen in so long, and he was just unbelievable. And, and he was one of those guys. One of those people, like he, you know, he says hello to everybody in the crew. He he tries to know everybody's name, and he's just, you know, so amazingly well mattered and gracious. And then when he walks away, and he walks out the door, and everybody in the cat in, in this, you know, the whole crew of myself were just like, oh, you just you just everybody loves him. You fall in love with Hugh Jackman, and you can't. And, and we're just talking about it all day long, right? We, we, because we had to go and shoot some B-roll in the neighborhood and stuff. And we're just like, oh my god, you, you, oh my god, <laughs> you know, he is. That's fun. You know, the, the 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 person you see, you see, you know, he has a great social media presence. He has a just a great presence in general. The person you see is exactly who he is, and and he's he's, he's one of these people that just uh, you know the, the success he, uh, you know all along you will not find anyone that says anything bad about Hugh Jackman because there's nothing bad to say. He's such a wonderful person. Well, I know he had a strong effect on you because it was soon after that that you took the time to learn my name after uh, sixteen yeah. years, which yeah. I thought was was thoughtful. It was it wasn't my favorite phone call, but I I I, I you know. <laughs> <laughs> when I was humbled, Hugh humbled me, and I, I had to, you know. So that's uh, season one of Storyboards. Uh, yeah. You're you're in the process, or you've already filmed season two, and I'm gonna—I don't know if I'm supposed to, but I'm gonna save the guest list for that because I know it's amazing. We have uh, listen, it's, it's, it's it's listen. Th- this is why you're oh, you'll always be mid level. You're taking a risk with this, but go ahead. <laughs> I'm just gonna take back. <laughs> uh, you've got the comedian Sashir Zameda on the list. You've got Taboo from Black Eyed Peas. Gillian Jacobs from Community, and she's also directed one of our upcoming Marvel 616 documentaries. You've got Sumita Mukhopadhyay of Teen Vogue, uh, which, no lie, I, I, I read Teen, Teen Vogue. And we've got Nelson Figueroa, who was a former pitcher for the uh, New York Mets. Now, we talked a little bit about Ed Viesters, who's a yeah. is Mountaineer the right term? I guess so. I mean, he, he, I don't know if he still holds the, the title, but he was the only person in North America to climb all the great peaks, right? All the great peaks. And, and many of them several times. I, I don't want to spoil too much of the episode because there's so much great story there, um, about, about, about Ed and, 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 and how, because the other thing is this, Ed's, you know, while he's been involved in rescue missions to bring people back, from from the mountains, right? Because things have gone wrong. 
uh, it's my understanding that Ed, as a prof- professional climber, when he's brought parties, right, of non-professionals with him to cr- climb Everest and things like that, he's never lost anyone. And the reason is because he is so incredibly cautious. Because again, to him, yeah, getting to the top is fine, but you got to make it down. And these are the things that I didn't realize. And, and, and the one little bit of business I'll give you is that there's always the possibility on those mountains because the weather is so extreme that it could change in in a minute. So so they have to have constant contact with weather stations and radar reports and things like that. So so you could be literally a hundred feet away from from the summit, right? And when you get that high, a hundred feet could take forever to get to because the oxygen is so low. So you take one step and you've got a you're you're sucking air, right? You just you're dying. So you have to calculate, well, if it's gonna take me X amount of time to get to to that summit a hundred feet away, I could see it. I could almost touch it. How much longer is it going to take me to get back down? So there's been times where he's called off expeditions, literally, where you could almost touch the summit because he knows he will not make it down the mountain alive. And, and that's something I never understood that at all. I mean, I had no knowledge that that's how they did it. I just thought they'd just camp out right there. Well, you can't. You have to get back to the base, you know? And, and the base could be at different levels of the summit. It was just, it's an incredible, incredible story, his story. Boy, that does... That does relate directly to conversations we have a lot when we craft our stories, particularly in comics, which is the beginnings are easy. Getting into some crazy story, Wolverine dies um, right. or whatever, but it's it's ending the stories, which I think we have our most uh, debate and conflict about is where yeah. we leave the characters yeah. uh, mm-hmm. at, at the end. And you knew Ed. You knew Ed personally before this, right? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, I've known Ed, Ed, Ed uh, again, and that's a connection that comes through ice skating because Ed's daughter, one of his daughters, is a is a figure skater as well. So, so you know, we just kind of met in the same circles, and and we were like, "Hey, what do you do? Hey, what do you do?" We're like, "Oh, wait, I've heard your name," you know, that kind of thing. And uh, and we just developed a friendship there. And, and when I asked him to do the show, you know, uh, he said, yeah, you know, we, we, we flew out to meet him. And again, it was like one of those, oh man, it's, I mean, we still would have, we still would have done the hike in the snow. It just wouldn't have been as pretty because the snow would have been already, there would have been melted snow on the, uh, you know, on the mountains, but this was like pristine. It was amazing. So it, it worked out really, really well. It was a great day. Yeah. But that's season two. Uh, season one is, uh, launching today, I think. Uh, Yeah. Yeah, so you can watch that Hugh Jackman episode right now uh, at Marvel.com and on the uh, Marvel YouTube channel. Joe, like storyboards, this has been uh, illuminating, educational. Uh, It was great to meet you. Pleasure, Steve. Uh, (laughs) I could see the crowd. I could see everybody at at, uh, San Diego. I could see everybody there. There's a kid dressed as Hawkeye. Yep. There's There's a kid dressed as Steve Wacker. You know, sad life ahead of him. So say it with me, Steve. Ready? We're going to close off. Ready? See See you in the the funny funny books. books.